This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Forget the frustration of picking commerce platforms when you switch your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling wherever you sell. With Shopify, you'll harness the same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash tech. How would you like a 15% discount to my daily email, the stack of stuff, the show notes, discounts to the conference, all of that? All you need to do is text the word SHOW to 33777. You'll get the annual subscription with a 15% discount to my daily email. You'll get the stack of stuff, the links to the show notes, discounts to the conference, and so much more. All you have to do is text the word SHOW, S-H-O-W, to 33777. Text SHOW to 33777. Welcome to the Eric Erickson Show podcast, Hour One. Hello, America. Welcome. It's Eric Erickson here across the nation. The phone number, if you want to be on the program, 877-973-7425. If you text the word Eric, E-R-I-C-K, to 33777, you can get today's um, the podcast, live stream, the show notes. I want to call your attention, please, if you would text Eric. In fact, let me, it's been a while since I've done this myself. 33777 is the number. You text the word Eric and you get back a laundry list of links, social media links, the live stream. The the very first link says subscribe to my daily note. You don't have to subscribe, but I really, really, really hope that you will click through and read the very first um, thing today. The, The title is pause by the time you click through, you may actually see today's show notes, which you you sh- paid subscribers get the show notes, all the links I'm talking about. But everybody, paid, unpaid, anybody who clicks through can read the piece that I have uh, posted this morning called called Pause. And I really, I, I'm, I'm not going to talk to you about it right now. I just want you to go read it. Uh, just text the word Eric, E-R-I-C-K, to 33777. Uh, The very first link that comes back will be the show notes link. Click it and read the piece I've written this morning called Pause. Now, we have big news we have to talk about. I knew this was coming, and out of the gate, it has arrived. The Department of Justice has sued Apple. You will forgive me for being old school and calling it Apple Computer because as I was growing up, um, it, it was Apple Computer. I'm a huge Apple fan. Every product around me right now is an Apple product. Uh, I like Apple. A lot of friends of mine growing up were into PCs and Windows machines because Windows machines were always customizable and very flexible. My son wanted a gaming PC. Apple sucks at gaming PCs, so we went to Vision Computer and got him his gaming PC. It's a Windows machine, and I used to have to be very proficient at uh, Windows machines because I was tech support for my law firm for a while. I tech support for my family. I used to do have a tech support job at my school. But my school growing up overseas, we used apples. I started in first grade on an Apple II, uh, and then an Apple IIe and IIc. And then my favorite Apple machine ever was the Apple IIgs. I loved the Apple IIgs. But they were moving to the Macs. They killed the IIgs. Uh, the first came the Lisa, which was a flop. And then the Mac, and my gosh, that machine was amazing. So for those of you who are used to modern Windows machines, those of you who are younger than me, Philip, originally you had something called DOS, and you had to put in command prompts to to get what you wanted. And then they started making graphical interfaces, GUI, graphical user interface. And then Apple came along in 1984 with the Mac and did something they called WYSIWYG. Uh, What you see is what you get. And the difference between the PC market and the Apple market is that the Apple market was closed. You had to buy Apple stuff. Things weren't always compatible with Windows stuff. It was a specific operating system with specific formats, and things weren't interchangeable. You could swap between one friend's PC and another friend's PC, and everything was compatible. But with the Apple stuff, it was all Apple or not. 
And I liked the closed Apple system because you were less prone to get viruses. All my friends with PCs kept getting viruses. And they said for a long time, well, it was because there's so many more. That's why they focused on it. It wasn't really true. Clearly not so now. I liked that it was closed and everything worked together. Well, Apple came out with the iPhone, and the history of the world has changed with the iPhone. In fact, uh, every phone before the iPhone had fixed keyboards. And afterwards, it's rare to find a phone these days with a fixed keyboard. Everybody mocked Apple for getting rid of the physical keyboard, and now everybody followed suit. In fact, Samsung notoriously copied Apple down to the specific look of the phone, uh, causing lots of lawsuits and settlements along the way. And then Apple did something that very few other companies in history have ever done. Invented a whole economy. Before the Apple iPhone apps were not really a thing. After the iPhone, and remember when Apple first came out, they bragged about using web apps. You could use web apps, but uh, everybody knew that wasn't true. It was a... uh, Half solution, even Apple realized it behind the scenes and started building an app store. And the app store economy exploded. And now there are companies that exist because Apple invented an app store and you could use their apps on your phone. And then Google came out with Android to compete with Apple. And and lots of lawsuits involved there as well between the two, stealing information and, and copying people's stuff. And now there's this back and forth every year. Apple releases an iPhone, Google releases its Nexus, and and back and forth they go over who copied who and who was first and who was last and whose was better, which camera is better, which system is better. And you have have this, this situation now where you can go with Apple, which is a closed system where everything works together very integrated. Or you can go with Android where it's a very open system, but it doesn't always work well together. And the Department of Justice is now suing Apple for its closed system. Well, you know, I, and I laughed at this reading through the lawsuit before the show. One of, one of the things that they're going after is, you know, the joke is the green bubbles, green chat bubbles. The Department of Justice, I kid you not, is suing Apple because the green chat bubbles give people an inferiority complex, suggesting that they are somehow inferior. They are. They are. That's not my opinion. That's a fact. Not the people, but the messages. That's the point of the green chat bubble. People don't understand. You see, the the Android system doesn't have proprietary messaging built in. Apple has something called iMessage. It spends a fortune on the back end for end-to-end encryption for text messages for its users who use its devices. So whether I'm on my Mac or on my Apple Watch or on my iPad or on my iPhone, I can send encrypted messages end-to-end that come across with all sorts of extra data that isn't possible in SMS. SMS messages are easily hackable, easily transmittable, easily findable, easily shareable, easily uh, stolen by nefarious people. So Apple uses the green bubble to signify to its users that you're sending and you're texting with a system that is not secure. And the blue bubbles mean you're texting with Apple's proprietary system that's highly secure. That's what it means. Apple built a system that is very secure, and now the Department of Justice is suing Apple for that system, claiming because it built a secured system that only its users can use, that's bad. That it's a monopoly. It's not a monopoly. I can send messages to my board op producer, Charlie, who refuses to get a superior iPhone and insists that we send him green chat bubbles. I don't like to send green chat bubbles to people because I don't like to talk to the poor people. And yet I got to with him and he's well paid. He's not actually poor. He just acts like it. Listen, y'all, this is a dumb lawsuit. The problem is, for example, one of the other things they're accusing Apple of is its wallet system. You can, you know, you can use Apple Pay. And credit card companies complain to the Department of Justice that Apple won't let them access the um, workings of the phone in order to use that system. Well, they won't because Apple made a choice different from every other cell phone manufacturer. And it's actually worked against Apple with the rise of AI. I mean, Siri is the dumbest dumbest of all of the the online voice assistants. Siri is terrible. Alexa is so much better. Um, the, the, the Microsoft system is better. The Google system is better. The reason Siri sucks is because Apple made the decision to leave everything on the phone. 
custom chips were made to be able to to do all the the functioning on the phone. So Siri constantly lags behind because everything is done over the phone. It's not transmitted over the web, so it's much more secure. And so the reason banks are not given access to Apple's NFC system, that is the little chip in the phone that allows uh, wireless payments, is because it would break down the security system of the phone to let third parties have access to that chip. It's all designed to protect Apple's consumers from hacking. It's all designed to protect Apple's consumers from being scammed. And because Apple went out of its way to protect its consumers, they're being sued by the Department of Justice for making a closed secure system. Another issue in the lawsuit is that Apple's watch works better with the iPhone. Well, of course it does. It's made by the same company. So it's all integrated and it's all about security and privacy. Really, this is a backdoor by the Department of Justice to open up Apple's systems so the Department of Justice can snoop on Apple's users better. For years, they've tried to get Apple to build backdoors into their systems so that the DOJ could snoop on consumers. And since Apple has refused, now they're being sued because supposedly they have a closed system. The app economy that you know today would not exist but for Apple. The phone economy that you know today would not exist but for Apple. And because it's been successful, the Department of Justice is punishing it when you yourself have a choice to use Apple or to go to Google and and Android. And the Department of Justice says the reason that this is a monopoly is Apple has made it very difficult for you to jump ship from Apple's devices to someone else. So, so you made your choice, consumer, and you decided you wanted to stay in Apple's system. Now, here's the problem. Some of you will say, well, this is no big deal because if you don't, if Apple's forced by the Department of Justice to open up its systems, you don't have to use that stuff on your phone. Except if Apple has to open its systems to the banks so they can use the NFC chip, to the apps so they can take advantage of the remote proximity locators, well, suddenly the hackers now know how to get in. Suddenly the hackers can get into the systems they've never been able to get into. And they can compromise my phone that doesn't have any of the stuff on it because they know the route through the back door now that they don't know right now. It undermines everyone's security by them doing this. But this is a larger issue from the Biden team. Let's go back to the JetBlue story from yesterday. The Biden administration has told JetBlue and Spirit Airlines they're not allowed to consolidate. That consolidation is bad for the consumers in the same way that Apple's closed system is bad for the consumers. Here's the problem. We're seeing this already. JetBlue's now cutting routes. They can't financially afford to do it. Had they been able to get the economies of scale and aviation by merging with Spirit Airlines, they would have been able to leave these routes. But now Spirit and JetBlue are cutting back routes and costing people jobs. People are losing jobs. Not only that, rates, fares are having to go up to be able to sustain it. It's actually anti-consumer to prevent the consolidation because not only has it put workers out of work, it's also reduced the number of available routes that JetBlue flies, thereby allowing other airlines to drive up their prices on these routes because they now lacked the competition from JetBlue. It was all so obvious. The problem with the Justice Department and the problem with the Biden administration are the same thing. They are completely dominated by people who are academics or nonprofit workers. They don't actually live in the real world where you have to make a paycheck and balance a budget and have revenue to be able to make ends meet to pay employees. They've worked in the academic setting where they they can have grand theories about privatization and monopolies and how they work. And they've worked in the nonprofit sector where they beg donors. They don't actually have to make a valuable commodity to generate revenue. And so they look at a company like Apple that is a for-profit business that makes a valuable commodity, or they look at JetBlue that for economies of scale needs to grow and the only way to grow is to merge. And they say, no, you can't do this because in my academic theory from 30 years ago, consolidation of the airline industry was a bad thing and therefore you can't do this and gosh apple you can't allow people to choose to be on your system and platform and be safe from hackers you must open it so we can get in through a back door and spy on your users great american success story apple is and because of it they're being punished by the biden justice department you do not have to use an iphone you do not have to use a mac You can get a Windows PC. You can get an Android device. For those of us who made the choice to go with Apple because we want everything to work and to be well integrated together, 
This ruins our decision making. We chose to get into the cult. We chose, knowing when we went in, it would be a closed system, and that's what we wanted because it was safer, it was secure, and things worked better. And we would be limited in some ways because, you know, the Mac is not the dominant um, computer system out there. iOS is the dominant uh, cell phone system out there, but there are actually more Android devices in the world than there are iPhones. Biden administration doesn't care about that. The Biden administration cares about feelings. And the TikTokers are upset about the blue bubbles in the chat system. And so the Biden administration had to take action because the raging progressives of TikTok demanded it. So they're suing the world's most profitable company that upended change, revitalized the economy, and made billionaires out of a lot of people who were able to take advantage of a system Apple built. And because they built it, they'll now be punished for building it and maintaining it. Thanks, Joe Biden. Hello, friends. Welcome. The phone number is 877-973-7425. Should you wish to be on the program today? You know, I just let me let me wrap this Apple stuff up. I wasn't going to start the show with it, but it's just I knew the lawsuit was coming, but they filed it. And it's such a a dominant thing. Uh, Apple is, if anything, the victim of its own success. And you should know it doesn't have clean hands. Uh, it has done some things very badly as it has become dependent on revenue from its app store. For example, uh, major companies, you want to do a digital subscription to them, you had to go through the app store and Apple take a cut of it. And there was no reason for this. So they gave exceptions to groups like uh, Netflix and others after much cam- uh, complaining. So I could I could download the Netflix app and then go to Netflix and do my subscription there instead of having to do it through the app store. But other companies weren't allowed to. So Apple does have problems. And the weird, wild thing about this DOJ lawsuit is they're ignoring the legitimate problems. You know, the European Union is coming after Apple as well. And the the EU is very, very open about why it's going after Apple because Apple um, puts its, the European Union's corporations at a competitive disadvantage. And they've been very open about that fact. I don't know why the DOJ is coming after Apple for giving people a choice to use a secure system that's not hackable, except I think that answers it in the way I phrased it. They want a backdoor in your phones that Apple hasn't given them, and this is punishment for Apple doing it. Because when you look at their actual complaints about Apple, every single one of the complaints ultimately ends in you don't allow backdoors into your system. Uh, The Democrats always like those backdoors. Now, I got to tell you about my bank, Old Glory Bank. They have a banking bill of rights available at oldglorybank.com. And you'll see that they are not like a lot of banks out there. They're not a woke bank. They're conservatives. One of the reasons I started an account with them about a year ago is with the big uh, debanking trends around the country where conservatives see their bank accounts close, gun owners and gun manufacturers and gun stores see their banks close. I know a gun store that was doing multiple millions of dollars of business with a regional bank and the regional bank shut down their account, would not tell them why. And we all know why it's because they're a gun store. And once the bank, once the account was gone, then the the bank updates in terms of services that it's not going to work with second amendment companies. Um, Old Glory Bank works with Second Amendment companies and works with Second Amendment supporters and conservatives. You can see their banking bill of rights, but also you should see my account. There's never been a fee taken out by the bank. Uh, No fees for checking or savings. It's a great bank, y'all. You do it all online, but you can deposit cash at retail locations around the country to get into your account. And that really works. I've done it several times now. Oldglorybank.com is the website. Oldglorybank.com. You can get an account set up with them in less than eight minutes online. Oldglorybank.com. It's a great bank, great online system. Member FDIC, equal housing lender, terms and conditions apply. Uh, look, I, I don't want to stay on this um, a, 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 a topic, but a, a buddy of mine who listens um, says he, a Cameo, his his dad's on Cameo, very popular on Cameo, the, the app where you can get someone to record messages and stuff, celebrities and others. Uh, his dad is a celebrity, and he said Apple takes 30% from Cameo. And then Cameo gets 25%, um, crazy amount. Um, Tons of companies get completely screwed because of the 30%. Uh, I actually have complaints about the way Apple does that. They've lowered it now. If Once your app has crossed the threshold of downloads, they reduce the commission. Uh, And I do have a problem there. But, you know, I'm old enough to remember. Do you know what the, the distributor's cut was of software before Apple's App Store? 
So Apple, if you put your app on Apple's App Store, Apple takes 30% commission. And Apple uses that money for its purposes, but it maintains the App Store, it maintains the system, it maintains the compatibility, maintains all these things with that 30%. Do you, but do you know what a software distributor took before Apple's App Store? Do, do you have any idea? For perspective, Apple takes 30%. If you came up with software and wanted to put it in, in locations for people to buy, you had to go through a software distributor before Apple's App Store. How much did the software distributor take? 80%. I'm not making that up. 80%. So Apple takes 30%. And we can now sit here all these years later, after more than 10 years after the App Store comes out, and say, oh, my gosh, 30%, that's outrageous. Yeah, it used to be 80%. And the more you sell, the more Apple reduces the percentage. I still think 30% is high. I, I recognize that. But uh, you're getting 80%. The, the software company is getting 80%. Um, so I'm not super sympathetic when it's completely revolutionized the economy of apps that wouldn't exist but for the App Store. And Apple only takes 30%. Um, I, you know, my syndicator takes more than that to distribute my show. Um I, I, y'all, I'm, I'm just, I'm not super sympathetic on that particular aspect of it, given what I know existed beforehand. Um, there, there are problems. I, I actually do think that the 30% should be reduced over time because over time, uh, I mean, you're, you're continuing to help Apple make money and people are going to the app store for your products, but 30%, it's used to be 80. Uh, Gavin, I want to go to you on the phones. Welcome to the show. How are you? Hey, Eric, uh, we might end up being, uh, neighbors one day on Lake Burton. Oh, my gosh. I want to, you know, there's a house up there for sale right now. It's like $8 million, and I'm like $8.9 million short of the $8 million needed to buy it. But I bought a lottery ticket yeah, just I'm, in case. I'm going to keep dreaming until I can make it happen. But, hey, I wanted to ask you, um, what what are we doing about the, the chip crisis, and what is the Biden administration doing to either fix it on our end or make it worse? You know, um, so the Biden administration, this is actually kind of funny. And, and Gavin, just so you know, full disclosure, I actually had this in my stack of stuff to talk about yesterday, and I never was able to get to it because there was so much going on and breaking news yesterday. So the Biden administration went to Arizona, big swing state. Intel has built a big uh, chip manufacturing um, facility there. And what is so funny about it is that Samsung and TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor, decided not to build chip manufacturing facilities because if you built the chip manufacturing facilities, you have to put the employees through DEI training. And the Asian company oh, said, we're not doing American DEI training. So they canceled their plans. That is ridiculous. Yeah, it I is. Mean, I, uh, I didn't realize that seems, was a thing. It, it seems like they're ramping us up to inevitably go to war with China, but it seems like Part of if we could manufacture those here, we could just maintain our strategic supply and not have to not have to deal with them over there and that entire issue. Yeah, we could. Now, in fairness, there are some like uh, security protocol chips, they call them. There's there are chips we don't want the Chinese having access to that we do build here. And the Dutch actually produce a machine that makes certain chips, even chips that go in the iPhone that we don't want China to have. And the Dutch have refused to sell the machine to China. The Chinese don't have the capacity to do it. And we're importing yeah. those machines into this country. So that we do have secure chips we're making here, but it's so much more expensive to make them here. It drives up the cost for everything. It just seems like a no-brainer that we would either put it in the hands of one of our allies or just do it here. But, you know. Yeah. Who knows? Well, and, and you know. Show. Thank you so much. Uh, one day, hopefully, we'll both have our houses like Burton. If not, I'll share mine. <laughs> have a good one. You too. Take care. Um, so I, I'm a big fan of the idea of ally shoring. Instead of offshoring, we ally shore. So we develop great relationships with India, Vietnam, uh, Malaysia. We go help them set up their facilities, and you build chips there. And, and you build chips there because they are. Um, it's so much cheaper to make there than here. Here, in addition to American labor laws and um, the demands for salary and stuff, it's just it's incredibly expensive to do things here that we can do abroad. Now, hear me out on this. This is my crazy idea that I continue to promote, ally shoring. 
Instead of offshoring, we ally shore. Let me explain to you how this works in my mind. It is absurd for us to repatriate a lot of technical production to this country, whether it's uh, chips or supply chain stuff, antibiotics, things like that. Here's why it's absurd. I know it sounds good. Oh my gosh, you're going to create American jobs, except Americans demand a whole lot more money than people who live in, let's say, Thailand. And the result is that the price will be so much more astronomical, you're not going to be able to afford the stuff. If Apple brought the iPhone and built the iPhone in this country, everything was built in this country, the chips and everything, you wouldn't be able to afford your iPhone. You would not be able to afford it. There's so much that you buy today that you buy because it's made abroad where labor is very cheap. And you can tell yourself, well, I'll be doing it here. You people are complaining about grocery prices right now. You're not going to go buy the $5,000 cell phone that used to cost 700 bucks. You're not going to do it. You can tell yourself you are, but you're lying to yourself because you're complaining about the price of grocery increases. Wait till your electronics skyrocket and your antibiotics skyrocket and everything else because they're going to be made by union labor in this country that's going to be paid $25 an hour such as opposed to $25 a day. We should ally shore this stuff, build up our allies in the third world, make strong ties with them. So we go to Argentina and we help the wonderful President Mille of Argentina, and we build capacity in Argentina. We help them set up the factories there, and that engages them with positive trade with the United States. We provide them great jobs making technical things for us, and they become tied to us. We go to India. We help India do this. We're actually beginning to do this in India. We go to Thailand. Even Vietnam is reaching out to the United States. Of all things, this is the wild one to me. Vietnam wants better relationships with the United States because though they are communists, they hate China, which is wild to me. I didn't realize this. Um, I, I, I genuinely think we can ally shore our goods and services. We help create a good workforce in these countries. That good workforce provides those countries economic stability. Our jobs provide economic stability. Uh, it keeps prices lower for us, maybe higher than we get in China, but still lower than we get here. It's a good thing that we should be doing. We should be looking at South and Central America. We should be looking at Southeast Asia, maybe even looking at parts of Africa where we can find and, and help create a well-trained workforce to do these things and provide us cheap supplies. And we use the American flag and American capital to make it happen. And we get our stuff out of China. It seems like that is in our strategic interest to do, ally shoring. We're not just going to China. We're not going to some country that hates us. We're specifically picking countries that we are building alliances with where we can, because of labor costs, produce things for this country cheaper. I don't know why we're not doing this. We should have been doing this with Haiti. Instead of letting Haiti collapse, Haiti has other problems, but you know, it does take an educated workforce. Um, again, though, Argentina. Argentina is a no-brainer to me. Argentina used to be the wealthiest country in the Western Hemisphere in the early 20th century. Uh, the Peronistas, the Socialists, the Nazis, they all collapsed that economy. It's now got hyperinflation, but they've taken a chance on a free market professor, a libertarian who's reforming the economy, this country, it is in our national interest to make that guy succeed. I don't care whether you're a Democrat or Republican. It is in our national interest for Argentina to come towards us. Argentina has pushed out under Mille, pushed out the Chinese, and embraced the Israelis, and embraced the United States. We should be doing everything we can to prop that guy up. El Salvador, uh, Bukele, we should be doing everything we can to help that guy create jobs in El Salvador. We should be ally shoring as best we can getting as many jobs as we possibly can into these countries to build up manufacturing facilities, distribution facilities, whatever we can to provide meaningful jobs for the people in those countries, knowing that allyship with the United States is not just them in servitude to us, but us in a free market transaction between the two where we're providing good jobs and revenue to them and they're providing uh, cheap goods and services to us. It's absurd the Biden administration has not gone down this road. It's absurd they haven't done this. The, you know, and, and the, the Trump administration was on the verge of doing it until he lost re-election. They, they were beginning to make inroads with India and Vietnam and Thailand and Malaysia and, and um, going back into the Philippines and things like that. We should be doing that. It's a no-brainer to me. It is a no-brainer. It's not outsourcing. It's ally-sourcing. 
It's not offshoring, it's ally shoring. It is getting our supply chain out of China into the hands of our allies in the third world and building up those third world countries with the American flag. But why listen to me? I don't know anything. I just grew up on that side of the world and know a lot of those people and, and talk to them regularly. Why, why, why bother listening to a guy like me? The phone number, 877-973-7425. I, I am going to switch gears now from the Apple stuff. If you got calls about it, that's fine. I'm, I'm happy to take your calls on the Apple stuff. I could talk about it all day. I am in the cult. And look, I acknowledge I'm in the cult. I acknowledge the company's not without its faults. It's It's got problems. It's been very high-handed in the way it's treated developers. It's been very heavy-handed in the way it's treated other businesses. And absolutely, but what's wild to me is the DOJ isn't going for that stuff. It's not targeting Apple for those things. It's targeting Apple for making a closed proprietary system that is safe and prevents backdoors into the system. And I don't think from a national security standpoint, I don't think it's a coincidence that the Department of Justice for years has wanted a backdoor in Apple, and Apple has repeatedly refused to give it to them. And so now the DOJ is using antitrust rules to sue Apple to try to get backdoors into its devices. Now, let me tell you about stamps.com before I get out of here because I've used them twice this week and I never had to go stand in a line at the post office. It's one of the many reasons you should be using stamps.com. How did I get out of the line? Well, I got my printer and I got my computer and I was able to print labels. I went out and bought my own scale. They'll give you a free digital scale. Uh, but um, weighed out my package. I got the label printed, and I arranged pickup by the post office. When they came and delivered my mail, they picked up my packages. It was great. I never had to stand in line. And, by the way, I got discounted rates because you can get up to 89% off with the post office and UPS. I've done this with UPS. I've done this with the post office. The system just works, and it works so well. With stamps.com, you go click on the microphone. You put in my name, Eric. You get this free limited time offer of some free postage, a free digital scale, and no contract to sign. You can cancel at any time. The digital scale is great. I went, again, I bought my own because I didn't take advantage of this offer. I've had them for 20 years, uh, and they just work. All you need is a mobile device connected to a printer. You need a printer. Uh, you can even buy a label printer from you can buy your You can buy your supplies from stamps.com, and then you get shipping and saving today. UPS post office up to 89% off. You can find the fastest or you can find the cheapest. You can arrange pickup. You don't have to stand in lines. You never have to deal with a human being again. It's wonderful. Stamps.com, click the microphone, put in my name, Eric, E-R-I-C-K, get shipping and saving today with Stamps.com, get the free postage, the free digital scale, and don't have to worry about signing a long-term contract because you can cancel at any time. Welcome back. It's Eric Erickson. The phone number, 877-973-7425. If you want to be on the program, y'all... <laughs> Uh, I yeah, the, the Biden administration malpractice just continues to get me. Um, it, it's it's remarkable to me the amount of political malpractice they're engaging in. Two hundred thousand deportation cases have been thrown out by federal judges since the start of the Biden administration because Biden's Department of Homeland Security did not file a required notice to appear with the courts in time. 200,000 deportation cases, you, you heard that right, 200,000 have been thrown out because the Biden administration did not file proper notices to courts on notices to appear. Now, just for perspective here, under immigration law, this is a mandatory requirement. You got to file the notices to appear with courts on time uh, to demand that people show up. If you don't do that, uh, you, there's there's no recourse here other than to throw out the case. There, There's, there's no recourse. Um, so don't be mad at the judges for doing this because the judges are required to do this. It's just kind of wild that something like this fell through, um, and yet it did. This is the Biden administration yet again screwing things up uh, and and allowing a whole bunch of people. Now, they can go back through and file the notices, and they can redo this. It is, it's fixable, but it slows down the process. It slows down the process because now you got to go find those people. Where are they? File the notices to appear again. Uh, it's just it's it's absolutely ridiculous that 
this happened, except you and I, of course, know that this is what the Biden administration regularly does. It screws stuff up. I was going to talk at the beginning of the show today about the political malpractice from the Biden team, and I wound up with the Apple news breaking, thinking I needed to cover it first. But when we come back, I do want to talk about this the real political malpractice of the Biden team, but it's tied into this other major story. They have now released new regulations that will ban the internal combustion engine vehicle. They're saying it's not a ban, but it is a ban. If a 15-week abortion ban is a ban, then this is a ban on the internal combustion engine. And it ultimately amounts to it. It's what they want. They want to get rid of it. What they're saying is, well, we're imposing new regulations, but the auto manufacturers can figure out how they want to deal with it. Well, the only way they're going to be able to deal with it is to get rid of the internal combustion engine. We'll talk about that, the politics of it, the malpractice of the Biden campaign. Right now, I want you to know this hour of the program is brought to you by First Liberty Building and Loan. They can help your business wherever you are nationwide. First Liberty Building and Loan, if you're buying a building, if you're building a building, if you're buying a franchise, buying out a competitor or a business partner, those are the deals they specialize in. Go to firstlibertyga.com. If you need $250,000 or more, firstlibertyga.com. Tell them I sent you. Now, for the parents out there of kids who are headed off to college, I might talk about this more later. FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid. If you don't have kids going to college, if your kids are too young for college or they've already been through college, you haven't heard about this story. We're living this hell right now. The Federal Department of Education, just so you know, if you go to any college or university in the United States that takes any sort of federal aid at all, All of the students have to fill out FAFSA. Every student who goes to any college or university that takes federal aid has to fill it out. It is the form the government and the universities use to qualify you for grants and scholarships and and financial aid. So you may not qualify for financial aid, but you still got to fill out the form. And the form used to be a very big form where the students had to fill out portions and the parents had to fill out big portions. What the government decided to do was kind of genius. Instead of filling out all these portions, they've got all your information already. So you just check a few boxes, authorize the IRS to hand your stuff over, the kids hand their stuff over, you put in some some basic identifiers and off it goes, except they've screwed it all up. The website keeps crashing. The data has been transmitted to universities in unintelligible form. My kid keeps getting notices that she needs her FAFSA in to qualify for scholarships, yet the she's done it, except the federal government can't process anybody's forms. They have completely screwed up FAFSA, claiming they were going to make it better, yet another government program, the government itself, has screwed up. It is such a disaster, and the media isn't even covering it. It's wild.